Good evening and welcome back to the shop once again here in beautiful downtown Canterbury. Tonight I'm going to launch into three of my favorite jigs to use on the bandsaw to help you do marvelous work. I'm actually making um, a pair of these lights. If you hadn't seen it and you're probably going, oh, that's beautiful. This is in Fine Woodworking Magazine and I wished I should have thought to reference that article. Um, I forget what issue it's in, but if you're a member on there, you can go online and just look up Chris Spexford and Lamp, and I'm sure the article will come up if you wanna follow along. But he made one of these with me on the season of um, classic woodworking, and I think it was one of the last, I think it was episode 10? 11 something like that but anyway um he has this lamp and one of the features of this lamp is it's very light construction there's bridle joints on the top and these light little sticks that come down they're just little half inch squares but they come through the bottom and they're wedged i think we might have used the same color wedge look we even signed it i got him to sign it 3 2018. all right so this these are little wedges in here. And what I wanna do is show you a simple jig for making little wedges. Now that might sound like, geez, that seems so easy. Well, anyway, other times you might need wedges are when you're making through tenons. Check this out. This is our little demo with a, we've got a tenon here and these kerfs are cut for the wedges for a through tenon. And then I drill this little hole at the bottom to keep it from splitting up into the piece. But it goes into the mortise, which comes right on through. And then on this end, we drive these little oak wedges. And the mortise has been widened like on an angle at the top and bottom. And these are just like little quarter inch pieces. So if I drive this in, you can see it getting tighter there but I would obviously do it with glue and then drive in both these wedges and that little outer part springs over and locks it in forever because there's glue on these wedges and it's not coming out. Here's one that is glued up and finished. This is cherry, same thing, and then the oak wedges. So really the same kind of wood with a finish on it and a little chamfer around the edge. So a little bit dusty, but this gives you the sense of the craftsman style integrity. You know, those through tenons that had that nice little chamfer. Pretty sweet. But you know, when you gotta make these wedges, it's one of those things where you're thinking, how do I make such a small little quick thing like that? Well, you wanna, I'm gonna show you how, and I always just do these. I knock these out fast on the bandsaw. The bandsaw is really a, a remarkable machine in the uh, shop, it's, it's a, it can cut straight lines, curve lines, resaw, tilt the table, cut angles, so many things. And then with different size blades, you can make tiny little tight curves. It's, it's really probably the most versatile uh, machine in the shop. And one of the great features of it is that it's probably one of the safest because the way the blip, it's a band of metal that's just spinning around and it's spinning on two wheels. There's a wheel in here and a wheel at the bottom. So when I turn it on, and I turn it off quickly, you can see the band, it's spinning down and the teeth are gonna cut down into the table. So all the cutting force is down. Whereas when you're cutting on a table saw, it's spinning toward you. And that's where the dangerous effects of kickback can happen and really hurt you. Um, also think about a router bit, that's spinning aggressively as well and kind of toward you, can pull your hand in or out. So those kind of tools have this horizontal force that can create danger for you. Whereas this bandsaw has just this downward force. And when the blade breaks, which it has on me many times, it'll scare you, but it'll stop almost instantly. It'll just bang, be done. If you've got guards and it'll just kind of crinkle right there. All right, so we're gonna set up to make this cut. 
what I'll do is usually I'll make some stock and just cut it about four to four and a half inches long. And I'm going to dress it first to the thickness of the wedge. So these wedges are just five sixteenths. This stock right here is about a half inch. So this would be the appropriate stock to make half inch wide wedges. Okay. So I'll just use that as the demo. Now I'm going to make a line. This, this one's going to be my jig. I'll make the wedges out of this stock. So I'm just going to make a line about three eighths of an inch from the end. And I'm going to use my finger as a stop. You can use a, um, a square if you prefer, but if you just do that gently, you'll get a nice straight line using your finger pinching against and drag it down. Okay. Now I'm going to mark when I think about a good angle, it's about an eighth inch wide over two, in two inches long. So just go from an eighth to nothing over two inches in length. Okay. That's what I'm going to go for here. So if I come up here and I'm going to mark an eighth inch over from my line right up at the top. And then I'll come down two inches from there. Okay. Two inches. So I'm going to connect those two lines. Now I'm going to slide my square, my rule down a little bit. So just get it laying across those two points. And now I just have to trace this out. Whoops. So if you've ever, this may look familiar to you because if you've ever made that tapered leg jig with me, it's essentially the same thing. We're just sawing a taper in material here. So what we want to do now, we've made this tapered line. This represents the size of the wedge. So it's about an eighth inch here and down to nothing here. If you want a, a less steep uh, taper, make it a little less than an eighth of an inch off the line at the top down to zero. And of course, if you need a longer, wider, thicker, just adjust accordingly. And then we're going to just go over to the bandsaw now and saw this away to that sloped line. And this is going to be our stop down here. That's why I used the rule the way I did. So let's cut that out. All right, so we'll get our stock. Here's our stock that we'll make the wedges out of. So uh, this doesn't have to be the same thickness as this material, but this is going to be my wedge material. So I'm just going to mark the center of this approximately, which I'm a little over two and a, I'm sorry, a little over four and a quarter. So let's just go right about there. This just to mark the center point. Okay, come on back over to the bandsaw and we're ready to cut wedges. Let me get my other sample piece. So when I'm doing this, I usually like to make a bunch because you set up and it's pretty fast. I've got two pieces to use so I'll, I'll show you making two. All right, so what I'm going to do is set the workpiece into that angle I just cut on this. This is my my tapering jig, my wedge making jig, that's going to sit there and I'm going to nest the piece in with the center mark out here. So now I'm just going to bring the fence over until I just touch that center mark, just about. Okay. My fence is, there it is, right there. Okay, that feels, that feels good right there. All right. So snug it up. Now what I'm going to do is hold the workpiece just into that little mouth right there and just push straight ahead, keeping my jig against the fence. And I'll get a little taper here. Ready? I'm going to go ahead and cut four.
All right. So check that out. We got four nice little wedges, super quick and easy. And now we, we want to straighten up our stock again. So I've got this. These were ripped. I don't know if I said that before, but they were ripped parallel. So now I need to re-straighten this edge and I'm going to get two more wedges when I do this. So I just need to move the fence over and I'm just going to set it just inside the end. So I'm going to just start cutting that point there. Here we go. the fence we've got eight nice perfect tapers all set there ready to go now if your bandsaw is kind of um, wobbly and it leaves a lot of roughness you can take the wedge, if you like, and run it across a little sandpaper like that. But I find it doesn't, I get a smooth enough cut right off the bandsaw that you don't need to do that. So, um, by the way, that's just like 150 grit uh, with a spray adhesive on a piece of three quarter inch plywood. So anyway, there you go. You've got the wedge and you can see from this, I usually like to fit the wedges in the kerf without it assembled to make sure that when I drive the wedge, I'm not going to bottom out, um, that I've got enough material. So I'll usually cut these back a little bit so they're not so thin on the end. But a wedge like this could work in here. You can see how that will go in nicely. And when I drive it, It'll push that right out and lock it in. All right, there you go. That is your wedge cutting jig. Is that something? <laughs> Woo, we're just getting started. I got two more. <laughs> Are you gonna talk about that book that's on to your right? Oh yeah, I do wanna mention that book because this was one of the earliest woodworking books I bought. I actually met this guy at a woodworking show in the in the late 80s. This guy was so amazing uh, demonstrating at, it was at the woodworking shows and those are still around. I bet some of you have been there. Go ahead and chat in if you've been to a woodworking show. <laughs> but I went to it down in Boston and I met some really good guys down there and uh, learned, learned, I was just in the early stages of picking up a lot of information. And he was so amazing uh, in the way he handled a bandsaw it really inspired me. He was demonstrating on the Inca bandsaw, the 10 inch saw that I was just using there that a lot of you know, have asked about. And by the way, the saw blade is a three eighths, six tooth per inch, the one I'm running right now. But <laughs> um, he had this tiny little blade on there. He was doing such an unbelievable uh, cuts and showing the versatility and what a bandsaw is truly capable of in the hands of a true master with it. And then I was so glad to see soon after he came out with the, hand, the bandsaw handbook. By this time, I think we were in North Carolina and he came down to a uh, Woodcraft or Woodworker Supply, one of those stores that was in Raleigh, North Carolina once to do a demonstration. So I drove the hour out from Wilson Rocky Mount and with a friend and we just watched him demonstrate there in Raleigh and it was kind of, it was probably like five years after I had first met him and he had the book and he had shared a lot of great tips. It was just learned a lot. So this is a great foundational book for a bandsaw. I don't know if he has it revised now or what, cause we're a lot older since then, but um, he, he talks a lot about 
setting up the saw, tuning it up, you know, correcting, maybe, maybe you've got some issues with it, you know it's not running properly, how to set the guides on there. And then he has some nice little exercises in the back of making cuts. And um, two of these things I'm showing you tonight came from what I learned from him. And one of them is directly from um, the demonstration that he did that night, which is gonna actually be the very next thing. So my next trick is to use a rub block if this is especially useful technique if you're doing multiple cuts uh, pattern work. So you might have a slight curve for a pattern. It doesn't work with all shapes because of, you'll see the tightness. If you have really tight curves, it doesn't work as well for that. But it can do great work for small pattern work. Um, just see the technique and maybe your imagination will remember this. But uh, let's just say you wanted to make an arc in a lot of pieces. Let's say you were making some arch doors and you had that kind of arc there and you wanted to get that radius cut quickly. Well, quite often we would take the pattern, trace it onto the workpiece, go bandsaw, get it back in the jig, and then go flush route it possibly to get a nice smooth surface. With this technique, I'm gonna actually take the template this is my template material. I already have the arc here, and I'm gonna get down on the bench here. Okay. And I'm gonna take it to my material, like let's just say, this is just an example piece, and I've got double stick tape there. I'm just gonna stick it onto my piece. Now, this, this block here is gonna become my rub block. So this is gonna help me to just bandsaw this away and I'm gonna use this stick to bandsaw along this curve in such a way that I leave a 16th heavy on that material, okay? So to do that, I'm just gonna, let's head over to the bandsaw. I've gotta prep this piece to make this work. So I've just got a piece of stock here. I'm gonna make my jig and what I wanna do I'm gonna cut this so this piece is gonna allow my stock to slide underneath it. So let's just make a little guideline here. And it, I just gotta make sure I give plenty of clearance there, okay? So I'm gonna cut this back. I'll do this in sections so you can see how this works. All right, so I'm going to get right about in the middle here. I'm gonna take that line off, ready? I'm just gonna cut about two inches deep or so. Go across. Okay. Now, this is gonna be my push block. So I'm gonna, this is gonna bear against this workpiece here, the, uh, my pattern. Um, now I see it clears nicely and it will slide against there. Now I wanna cut this to a little curvature to accommodate and I'm gonna clamp it about like this. So I wanna give it some curvature like this so it'll be able to go all the way in. You'll see what I mean in a second. All right, and then I'm gonna notch it to allow it to slip over the blade. So to notch this, I wanna make it wide enough for a 3 8 inch blade. Okay, that's just a little over 3 8 of an inch. And I'm gonna cut across here and take that out. You'll see why in a second. All right, let me go ahead and bandsaw this.
that that uh, last cut I was making directly into the teeth uh, is pretty unconventional, but that's actually called a nibble cut to just nibble away rather than saw a curve. I couldn't keep going back and forth there, but that's what I wanted to do right there. So now, I think I'm gonna cut this a little more. Okay. Let me get that curve a little bit. All right. I'm just going to hit that on my sandpaper really quick. Do you have a preferred um, source for your bandsaw blades, Tom? Um, I get them from Suffolk Machinery. Uh, they are the Timberwolf blades, but if anybody else has a good source, please chime in. I know there's multiple places, but I just wanted to smooth that out a little bit. This is not perfect. I would have taken my time more. But here's the key to it. I'm gonna come in here. Now I'm going to push it so that the blade is set back into that groove. So about a 16th of an inch away from the edge here, okay? And I'm gonna clamp my piece on there. Let me get the clamp position and then I can Work out the exact position there. All right, so the blade is set back just a touch there. Now I'm gonna come in here, and all I'm gonna do is use this outer block as a rub block against my pattern. I just have to keep that on there and just go right around. And because the blade is set about a 16th away from the end of this piece, it's going to yield a cut about a sixteenth away from the actual workpiece down here. So if you think about it, if you're making multiple cuts and you're able to put whatever kind of template you have on a piece, you can do concave or convex curves. On a convex, you might have more of a flat cut here or whatever, but let me just show you how it goes. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to move right from here. We're going to slip over and go right to the, the shaper table where we've got a flush cut bit. Without changing anything, we can go one to the other, and before you know it, you'll have a beautiful pattern cut on there by using this rub block. But you see that, like how once I have the setup made, you're ready to make a run of pieces. Now it works in certain situations, so it's a good, it's a good little trick to have in your bag should you need it. Um, the double stick tape, I have found, I have a love-hate relationship with this tape. <laughs> I used to love it and use a lot, but it, because it's so gummy and so sticky, you have the time it takes to put it on and then remove it from the, the workpiece. You've seen me use other methods. Uh, sometimes I'll use those little toggle clamps. If I set up a true jig for repetition, that's great. You can set it up with stops. Or you can actually put little brads in and snip them off. And so you get these spurs that'll actually hold and allow you to quickly move where this stuff not so much. I want to show you one quick last trick, but all it is, is instead of using a flat fence on your bandsaw, 
your regular flat fence, you're going to make your own fence, which is called a pivot point. So rather than cutting along a, a straight edge and bearing, you're going to bear against just a point in space. Why do you want to do that? Good question. That will allow you to follow curves to cut parallel curves one to another. Let's just freehand a curve on here, but usually you're, you're going initially to a line. But let's go ahead and freehand a curve, and then we'll, I'll demonstrate that jig. All right, here we go. So now you want to start with an initially a uh, smooth surface. So whatever you start with, you're just going to smooth it out. Sometimes I'll, I'll actually shape it to a pattern, but we'll just use this for now. That's good. Um, let's do this one too, so I can show you two different styles here. Just the reverse curve. That's fairly smooth. And now we're going to take the point that I just showed you and we're going to bring it in and this is going to be my pivot point. So if you imagine I'm lined up right even with the teeth here, I'm going to come back and a little forward of me and I'm going to put it apart however wide I want to make that piece. Right there I've got a little over half an inch. And I'm going to just clamp it to the table. Here we've got a little more room than we did last time, so that's a little easier. But make sure your point is slightly ahead of the teeth like that. And then you're going to make a bandsaw cut. We're going to come in here and we're going to bear this parallel, I mean this curved surface on that point. So you've got to keep moving kind of the back. It's almost like you're fishtailing in the back to keep the saw cut parallel to this curved line. So what I'm looking for is right along this edge, I want that to be parallel with the blade or 90 degrees to my feed here. So I'll be turning it as I advance and then I'll come back always looking right in here. I'm looking for that 90 degree line to the front edge. All right, here we go. You do that repeatedly and you end up getting this nice match set of curved and they're the same thickness. I can feel them the same thickness. So you're able to saw these consecutive parallel curved shaped parts. Now you might say, where are you going to do that? Well, here's, here's a, bunch, a bundle of pieces. Some of you may recognize these. These were from the Adirondack chair. So that's a nice curve that these were sequentially cut just one after another using that very technique. First I would shape and clean up one surface and then I would bear against a push point. Now that push point is a little low. So what I did was you can make a, a variation of it. So here I've got a thicker piece of stock and here's my push, my push point. So by using this thicker piece of material, I'm able to bear against a higher piece of stock. So it's nice because you can use your fence. I bring my fence in, line it up about just in front of the blade, and I'll put some clamps on here. 
and I'll clamp it across here, across there, then I can just move it away whatever distance I want on either side of the blade and then feed again a bearing against there. So there's a lot of different styles you can use, but essentially it's the same principle. You just have a point, a triangular kind of point here that you're bearing against. So with thicker material, like this was almost two inches thick, I bared against that and just rolled around. I just had to clean up the back side. And when these are all assembled, here's how it turned out. No, very quickly, you had all the curves on. There's nine pieces there and you're able to get them out quickly to make that back of that chair. So there you have it. Three quick little ideas. We have the rub block for multiple pattern cutting, the wedge jig, and, <laughs> and the pivot point for cutting consecutive curves. We pick up a lot from each other and that's the beauty of being in a community like yes, this. It is. And if you're not aware, we have this insiders community called the neighborhood and you can move into the neighborhood mm -hmm. by checking that out on our website at epicwoodworking.com yeah. we'd love to see you over there you get a lot of benefits by being in there you'll get free access to the courses that we do online this year which is well worth the cost of entry to begin with then there's a forum on there with other insiders and we've gotten to know a lot of people it's it's really great and growing right there and you get discounts on plans all kinds of other little insider videos as well. So check that out over on the website. And if you like this content, remember to like, share, and subscribe. We love it when you do subscribe and it keeps us connected with you better as well. All right, thank you so much once again. I hope you enjoyed that as much as we did. And on behalf of the camera lady and myself, we'll look forward to seeing you next time, right back here on Shop Night Live. <laughs> All right, a little louder. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Night, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. <laughs>